Donc, sans plus tarder, euh, nous accueillons M. Miguel Nicolelis, professeur émérite de la Duke School of Medicine et Neurosciences, professeur de neurobiologie, de génie biomédical, de psychologie et de neurosciences, et fondateur de l'Institut international Edmond et Lili Safre pour les neurosciences des natales au Brésil. Actuellement, Nicolélis est une voix active dans cette période particulièrement difficile de crise sanitaire et politique au Brésil. Il réalise des, des importants efforts de communication avec les publics. Donc, je, je vous remercie pour cet effort. Et sans plus tarder, euh, je donne les titres de la conférence. « Ad view of the future for brain-machine interfaces, basic research and clinical applications. So, » Monsieur le Nicolas je vous invite à partager l'écran et la parole est à vous. Merci beaucoup. Uh, uh, already I have to apologize for the background noise because I'm, I'm giving this uh, talk from my living room in my apartment in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And unfortunately, there's a lot of construction work around the area, but uh, I guess we'll survive. And, uh, but Again, thank you very much. I have been in Montreal a few times in my career, always had a wonderful time with my colleagues uh, at, at the university and uh, also have very interesting stories surviving a trip from Quebec back to Montreal during the winter, driving for the first time in, in what I would call the, the heaviest snowstorm I have ever seen in my life, but I'll leave that for, for later. Uh, what I want to give you uh, uh, today is, is a, a broad overview of this field that I helped uh, create about 22 years ago. Uh, and as most things that happen in science almost by accident, because I was in a, in a, uh, moving in a completely different direction. I, of course, I'm a, uh, by training, I'm a, a, a systems neuroscientist. Uh, and since the beginning of my career, I was interested in, in very abstract uh, issues on how the central nervous system encodes information, particularly tactile and later motor information. And in fact, uh, when I went to the US uh, to work with John Chapin in Philadelphia uh, in uh, 89, my main reason to moving out of Brazil and going to uh, the US was to be able to do what you're seeing this slide here. In the late 80s, it was pretty clear to some of us, not all of us, but some of us in the neuroscience community, that we could not keep going with the methodology, the electrophysiological approach that had become very classic, uh, recording the extracellular activity of one neuron at a time. You know, And as you know, uh, our brain has 86 billion neurons. And I used to make a comparison that Recording one neuron at a time, trying to understand how the human nervous system works is like going to the Amazon forest and trying to understand the ecosystem of the rainforest by going one tree at a time. Not a very good idea. It would take a long time to make sense of the data you collect. So I came to the US because John Chapin was the only guy uh, at that time that shared the same view that I had that we needed to look at populations of brain cells populations of neurons simultaneously to try to understand how the brain works. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a rodent, a cockroach, or, or a human brain. The brain is about populations. And this is the first time in my lab at Duke uh, that we recorded 100 neurons, the extracellular signals of 100 neurons in a awake, fully behaving uh, rhesus monkey. And this is just a few seconds of this storm, this electrical storm taking over the frontal parietal uh, lobes of the brain of this animal as the animal is preparing to make a decision. And it, as it turned out, uh, I'm going to show you in a moment, John and I look at this, you know, 22 years ago, and we basically found a way to look at these patterns in real time and predict about 100 milliseconds ahead of time what these animals were about to do. And that was when we created this field called brain machine interfaces. But just to give an idea, it was a long journey. Uh, I did a postdoc four years with John, then I moved to Duke in 94. And I had been there, you know, until I became an emeritus professor last month. And in parallel, I created this institute here in Brazil. And for, you know, this almost four decades, uh, I have been looking for the most part of how cortical circuits uh, uh, explain uh, um, 
primate behavior and basically trying to map the dynamics of these circuits and all how much they can change themselves dynamically uh, through a, a property that we call brain plasticity. So I, I, I did this for, you know, 20 years. And at that point, when I met John after a few years, we realized that we are the first ones to look at how these big circuits operate in real time, not in deeply anesthetized animals, but in fully behaving animals. And from the data we collected together, and then after I moved to Duke with my students over the years, we derive a few principles uh, that today have been reproduced by many independent groups all over the world uh, called principles of neural ensemble physiology or neural population physiology. And back in, in 98, I never forget that because it was a dinner that John and I was having, we we're having uh, in Philadelphia, in the outskirts of Philadelphia, in the main, most famous cheesesteak joint in the city. If you don't know cheesesteaks, you don't know anything about Philadelphia. Cheese takes a one foot long, you know, as they say, cheese and a little bit of meat sandwiches that you eat. And they're the most popular uh, lunch you can get in Philadelphia. So we're having this meeting together in this famous restaurant surrounded by truck drivers. They were, you know, stopping at I-95 to, to have a lunch in this famous place. And John and I were debating how could we convince our colleagues that it's not about one neuron, but it's about populations. And at that time we were eating and talking about, and we said, well, maybe if we could link brains to machines and demonstrate that we can only control robots to do what uh, animals and humans do with their uh, motor cortices, controlling their own bodies. Maybe if we link brains to machines, we can have demonstrations that will be completely unequivocal. And we can demonstrate our theory on how the brain operates. And the moment we said, let's call it brain machine interface, this new area, a huge truck driver stood up behind me, came to us full of cheese in his bird and said, that's a great name. So we had an instantaneous peer approval of you know, the new name of this field. And long and behold, this took over. And in two decades, it has become one of the hottest areas in, in neuroscience, particularly because it can take basic science discoveries like the ones I'm going to show you in a moment to the clinical arena. And it can now provide complete new therapies, uh, non-pharmacological therapies. That's a very important point. You can now interact with the brain in a therapeutical way uh, that doesn't require any drug to be administered to these patients. And I'm talking about things that when I went to medical school here in Sao Paulo, my neurology teacher told me never to work on because I would never find any therapy or any treatment. Uh, things like spinal cord injury, uh, Parkinson's disease, chronic epilepsy, untreatable chronic epilepsy. And long and behold, 20 years after we created this area, now we have uh, things called neuroprosthetic devices that are being introduced to treat exactly these diseases that today account for hundreds of millions of people around the world. So it's a it's almost like we are witnessing the dawn of a new type of neurology. Uh, and it's coming not from the pharmaceutical, pharmacological arena, but from new ways to uh, understand how brain dynamics uh, works and how it goes bad when the system is disrupted by whatever cause that generates a neurological psychiatric disorder. In fact, from these uh, studies, I have come up to a complete new theory of the brain I have just recently published a book on it uh, and basically proposed that the, a unifying theory on brain disorders, uh, ending with this distinction between neurological and psychiatric disorders and unifying this. And I hope I can tell you a little bit about it in a moment. But coming back to the topic, this was the first systems engineering diagram that John and I published uh, when we proposed uh, to create this field uh, to create a brain machine interface. Basically, you need a brain, uh, something that at least in Brazil among politicians is pretty rare right now, but you need a functioning brain uh, and you need sensors that can record either in an invasive or non-invasive way, large scale electrical brain activity. Then you need uh, all sorts of dedicated microelectronics and computational tools 
that allow us to read this large scale electrical activity and in less than 300 milliseconds as basically the time that uh, your animals or your human patients will tolerate you to process this information and generate outputs uh, that can control devices. So in less than 300 milliseconds, you need to read, condition, analyze, and transform these signals, extract motor parameters from these raw electrical brainstorms and transform them into digital commands that robotic, electronic, or virtual devices can understand. Once you condition these signals and you extract motor parameters and transform them from analog to digital commands, as you can see very quickly, we can control in real time uh, robotic devices like this, a robotic arm, electronic devices, you're going to see in a moment, an electronic wheelchair being controlled by directly by the brain of our subjects, or virtual tools like an avatar body that humans and animals can learn to control to perform a task or to train themselves to re, uh, rehabilitate their brains from a lesion like spinal cord injury. And of course, we soon discovered that none of these would be useful unless we could provide visual, tactile, or any other type of feedback to the brain, to the subject's brain the brain that generated the control signals in the first place. So it's very important that you realize that no brain machine interface works without a closed loop control, without feedback being provided from whatever is being controlled by the brain to the brain that is generating the control signals. Uh, one more important thing that we soon discover in the first study, uh, when you once you liberate the brain from its own physical limits, the limits of the body that hosts this brain, the device that is controlled doesn't need to be next to the subject. It can be in another room, it can be in a different country, it can be in, on the surface of the moon. You know, if you can deal with the delay, that's fine. The concept works whatever uh, this device is placed. And that's very important. You're going to see why in a sec. So just to show, we had to work on many types of technologies. I, I don't have time to, to discuss all of them. I think the, the most important technology for the animal work that supported the entire basic science on brain machine interfaces that allowed us to move to clinical studies uh, is the many generations of sensors that we produce over the years at Duke uh, to implant in the brain of animals. Uh, up to the third generation that we call recording cubes. These are 3D printed systems that you can condition very hair-like flexible filaments, metal filaments that can basically be arranged in any 3D configuration you want according to the structures you want to, to implant in the brain. And the, the big thing about this is you do once the implantation and you never again touch the implant. You can move individually uh, the microwires or in groups, but you never touch the implant. So that remains uh, implanted on the brain uh, forever, as long as the animal uh, lives. And we realize that these implants, as far as we know so far, can last for at, at least a decade. Uh, and you can keep recording, which is very, very important. So this is uh, one of the largest implants we ever did, close to 2000 neurons. This is a bird's eye view of this implant. So you're looking from the top on the implant on the head of the animal. This is sealed. You're going to see in a moment. So there's no problem for the animal. The animal can live with this, as I said, for many, many years. Uh, it's very lightweight. It doesn't produce any uh, uh, problem for the animal to carry these electronics implanted. Uh, and it's conditioned uh, with a wireless interface right now. So you broadcast these signals without cables. So the animals can be doing whatever they want. And you, if you want, you can record 24 seven. You can basically have a library of brain activity of your animals, not only one animal, but many animals in the colony as you're going to see in a sec. This is uh, what I meant in terms of longevity. This is an animal that I implanted in 2009, we published uh, I'm sorry, we published this paper in 2014, so you only see data up to 2014, but we kept publish, uh, recording from this animal 
up to 2019, 2018, September 2018. So it lasted almost a decade. And as you can see, for one decade, we only use eight animals for doing hundreds of studies in the lab. And the quality of the recordings remained very good, really high signal to noise ratios throughout the duration of this implant. So this is how it looks. Uh, you have a lightweight system to protect the hardware. The hardware is implanted. You put your wireless chip on top and you seal it. So the animals are liberated and they can live in the colony. They can live among themselves with no problem uh, whatsoever. So we have documented all monkey behaviors you can imagine or recorded brains and animals doing social interactions as I'm going to show in a moment and all sorts of behaviors with no problem whatsoever over this uh, more than 12 years that we have had uh, this new technique available. So let me show you how a brain machine interface operates. So if you need, if you have any questions, please just interrupt me at any time. Uh, in French is, is going to be difficult for me, but either in Portuguese or English or in Spanish, I can handle it. any question you may have. So this is a monkey that is trained first to use a joystick to control a computer cursor to cross a target that appears randomly on the screen. It's like a sphere that randomly shows up. And if the animal crosses that target in a allocated time, let's say one second, it gets a drop of orange juice as a reward. And monkeys love that game. They will play for hours and they will do, you know, 12, 1300 trials a day and get half a liter of orange juice and be very happy and, you know, sing about it. They, they sing to you that they are very much enjoying this, this play for, and they are very competitive. They want to win the game. It sounds familiar actually. Uh, but here you have the, one of the first experiments, actually the first experiment in Rizzo's monkey where we are recording a hundred neurons simultaneously we are processing this, as I said, in a wall of computers for 300 milliseconds and sending commands to a seven degree of freedom robotic arm that is in a different room that after a training period is going to take over, the hand of this robotic arm is going to take over controlling the cursor movements under the control of the brain activity produced by the animal. But in the first few minutes at that time, the animal had to play the game so we could train our mathematical models to reach a performance level that was sufficient for the brain machine interface to be on and allow the animal to control to produce these movements of uh, the cursor crossing the, the target. So you could continue to drink orange juice, but at that point, without making any overt movement of its own body. At that point, the brain was liberated, the animal relax and he could only imagine what he needed to do to play the game because the brain machine interface would take care of the rest and the robotic arm would assume the control of the cursor to get the animal the reward so let me show you our favorite monkey aurora playing this game she's a pioneer of brain machine interfaces is, is she's became very famous all over the world because she could do this very well so I don't know if you can see the movie now. Uh, Aurora is using this uh, joystick to play the game in real time. You can see that even before the cursor appears, she's trying to guess where the cursor is going to appear. She's very eager to drink the orange juice. She's trying to cheat basically, but she cannot cheat because this target appears randomly in one out of 32 different locations. So it's impossible to play the game just by random uh, randomly cheating. Uh, sometimes she may get it right, but uh, as you can see, she has to recalibrate her movements when the target appears and get into the target and get the juice. And she's doing that very well. So at that point, this was the first night uh, in 2003 that we actually said, okay, after two years of work, this may actually work. You know, because we had sent several grant proposals to NIH and at that time, the reviewers were saying that John Chapin and I needed professional help of the psychiatric variety because this would never work. How could we communicate with monkeys uh, to get this right? The timing, the way they had to do after we turn on the brain machine interfaces. But well, two years later, here you can see 
the joystick is gone. We are going to turn the brain machine interface. And this is the first time that Aurora got it. She got it that she didn't need to worry about moving her arm. She just needed to imagine what the arm movements would look like to get the cursor inside their uh, target. And somehow the cursor would get there. And the cursor now is under the control of the hand uh, of the robotic arm that is in a different room. And Aurora is, is you know, slowly learning that she just needs to imagine what she wants to do. And we are going to do this job for her. So there is a free lunch in the US. You just need to have a brain machine interface to get it for you. Uh, because Aurora, we had EMG uh, sensors all over her body and no EMG activity was being produced all over her body. She was just controlling that with about a hundred neurons uh, uh, conveying a global message to our algorithms that could get the motor parameters needed to control a robotic arm to do this trick. And in fact, when we look at the brain activity coming out of Aurora's brain, we soon realize it, and this was a shock to the entire community, that all over the frontal parietal loop, you could get information about this movement to help Aurora get the juice. Uh, the blue line that you see here is the primary motor cortex where everybody told us we should go. The only area that people believe we could get enough information to do this experiment. But look at this, supplementary motor area, primary so much sensory cortex, the primary touch area of the macaque brain. This is premotor dorsal and this is the posterior parietal cortex, way back, way caudal. Uh, of course, the primary motor cortex has more information per neuron, but you could get information about any parameter. We look at 21 different parameters and all these cortical areas convey some sort of information regarding different parameters. I'm going, I'm showing you here only two, hand position and gripping force, but we had 19 other parameters and you may see that the color distribution look different because different cortical areas have different levels of uh, specialization for each parameter, but nonetheless, uh, the representation of information to move the arm was all over the frontal parietal loop. Something that, you know, was pretty shocking to see in 2003. So the encoding of information was highly distributed and each cortical area was multitasking, was representing multiple parameters. I'm going to show you more in a moment including primary motor cortex. Well, a few years of development and we got this to a very sophisticated level of interaction. In fact, we created multiple spin-offs of the concept that I showed to you in the first slide. This is perhaps the most sophisticated one, which I believe is going to be the basis of the second generation of neuroprosthetic devices that are starting to, to reach uh, a translational level right now. They are going to become clinical applications very soon. I call them brain machine brain interfaces. Why? Because in these devices, not only we can get signals wirelessly now out of a brain to control a device, in this case, an avatar arm of this monkey. So this monkey can imagine movements and an avatar arm in a virtual reality space can be moved. Uh, to scan different objects. But now, as this avatar arm is scanning, is using its virtual fingers to touch virtual objects, we can send electrical signals proportional to the textures that the fingers are touching all the way back directly to the brain. Directly to, in this case, to the primary somatosensory cortex, the touch area. So animals can use this brain machine brain interface in this particular case to perform a tactile discrimination task. So they can control a device that is scan three different objects that look alike visually, but each one of these objects have a particular fine texture that you cannot see. You can only identify when you rub your fingers on the surface of these objects. If you, you know, where one of us, of course, could use your fingertips to do that, but this is a virtual space. So the monkey has to use a virtual tool 
which is like a virtual arm, and is touching and receiving appropriate tactile feedback through what we call cortical microstimulation. So what I'm going to show you is how we implemented this brain-machine brain interface in a task in which the monkey has to do exactly what I just told you. Uh, there are three objects moving on the, on the screen on virtual space. Each one has a particular texture that is signaled to the monkey by electrical signals that are feedback into the brain of the animal. And the animal has to choose one, a particular texture to grab. Because if it does that, it gets juice as a reward. Okay, so you're going to see a monkey playing a tactile discrimination task only using the brain, no part of the body whatsoever. It's controlling a virtual arm and the virtual arm is touching objects and the perceptual experience needed for the monkey to select the correct object is basically being achieved by this feedback delivered directly into the brain of the animal. Is that clear? So look at this. This is a movie of this experiment. Of course, the sound and the labels are only for you. The monkey didn't hear anything and he couldn't see anything. But what you're going to see is the monkey trying to use the virtual arm controlled by its own brain activity to scan different objects. And when he finds the correct texture, he puts the hand in the center and if he's right, he gets a reward. Immediately, the objects change position. He has to do it again. And if he does right, he gets a reward, okay? You're going to hear in the background one brain cell. That's what I do for a living. I listen to neurons. People don't realize that. The neurophysiologists actually listen to cells. Uh, so the electrical signal is what I learned to identify. I can tell you where in the brain we are just by the signal, the noise that you're going to hear now. And when the animal does it right, you're going to hear a very high frequency pitch. But as the animal is exploring the objects, you're going to hear a sound that is proportional to the electrical feedback that we are providing to the brain. So you have a feeling for how the task uh, occurs. So that's the brain. That's a neuron. Those are the feedback signals. The animal found the correct one. And he got a reward. Touching the objects again, found the correct one, got a reward. Found the correct one on the first try. He has to explore a bit the textures, found the correct one. So, as you can see, the monkey is drinking a lot of juice. So both the avatar arm and the feedback is basically delivered directly to the brain. So in about two weeks, these animals become as proficient in doing what you just saw as if they were using their own fingertips to do a similar task in, in real life. So you can prove that, or we prove that if a person was paralyzed, couldn't move its own body, we could have a brain machine brain interface to allow the person to control a robotic arm or a virtual arm. And when he touch objects in his space, this person could get feedback and interpret the shape and textures of objects that they are touching without any involvement of the body. Because as you know, when you have a lesion of the spinal cord, below the lesion, you cannot move your body, but you also cannot sense anything coming from your body below the level of the injury. And that's a major problem. Before I show you the second part, the clinical data, I need to show you that we took this to a very high level of control, even to objects that no monkey has ever seen before. So this is a monkey, an experiment in which monkeys learn to use this wireless interface to control an electronic wheelchair. Nothing that a monkey has ever seen in the wild. Uh, and we wanted to prove that uh, brain machine interfaces could 
generalize. Animals and humans could learn to control devices using their brain activity that they never saw in their lives, like electronic wheelchair. So what I'm going to show you in this movie, uh, first from the ceiling, a camera on the ceiling of the lab, is a monkey that is placed randomly in one of these three positions in the room, and he has to use the brain activity to drive the wheelchair all the way to the other wall of the room to collect grapes as a reward. But it's all done uh, in an improvisation way each trial, because once he collects the grapes, we move it to a new location. The animal has to imagine a trajectory. We have to send this brain activity related to the trajectory to our computational software. And the animal learns to drive this wheelchair just by thinking on how to get to the other stream of the room to collect grapes. So you're going to be the, you're going to see the first self-driven car driven by brain activity directly, not by any movement of the body. So let's see first from the ceiling. This is a wireless interface. So you can see the monkey driving the wheelchair, no cables attached collecting grapes, we move it to a new position, the monkey has to improvise a new trajectory, and it can basically drive the wheelchair no matter where we put it in the space, is going to come up with a trajectory first mentally, and then the trajectory is translated into whatever the monkey needs to get to the target. And as you can see, the monkey only starts moving when it's getting close to collect the, the grapes, so it doesn't need to produce any movement whatsoever. Of course, this is a healthy monkey, but from this experiment, we realized that a paralyzed human could do the same. And that's uh, one of the major discoveries because at the same time that we are investigating the clinical potential of this technology, we're doing basic science. And one of the key discoveries of this experiment that shocked a lot of people was that in primary motor cortex, we, find, we found cells that behave like the classical place cells that have been found 40 years ago and were uh, worth a Nobel Prize to my good friend, Professor John O'Keefe uh, in the hippocampus. And for a long time, people thought that place coding, space coding was only happening in the hippocampus. Well, not anymore. You can find these place-like receptor fields all over the primary motor cortex and even in the primary so much sensory cortex. And it makes total sense because the space coding is essential for moving yourself in space as primates. Uh, recently, just a year ago, we published this in 2018. And of course the hippocampus community was not very happy with me. Uh, thought that again, I had done, I had stepped out of my boundaries as a humble motor cortical physiologist and was touching on this pristine territory called the hippocampus. Uh, unfortunately for them, or fortunately, a year ago, two independent groups have shown that in monkeys and in rats, like exactly what we did with complete different preparations. So place coding is happening pretty much everywhere in the cortex right now. And it's, it's a very interesting thing because it changes completely the notion of a cortical hierarchy. I, I never believed in it uh, at all, but now I have a proof that even the humble primary motor cortex, very sophisticated encoding is happening like space coding. Uh, before I go to the clinical uh, results, just to show you that this technology also allowed us to look at interactions between primates in our colony. So this is our alpha monkey driving its own private car to get to a location where he can eat uh, uh, grapes during the day. And this is a lower Delta member of the colony who is very afraid of the alpha monkey getting close to him. But if the alpha gets to the location and collects the grapes, in this social task, our Delta monkey gets free juice. So this monkey has a vested interest that the boss does the task correctly. And meanwhile, we are recording both brains as they stare at each other as the alpha monkey drives around, collects grapes, and this guy gets reward. And when we look at both brains simultaneously, we're shocked. I never expected to, this, to see this, but this is the about 
150 neurons in the observer, the delta monkey brain. It's about 100 neurons in the alpha monkey driving. And what we saw throughout the time that the monkey is driving, the alpha monkey is driving, is that both brains get synchronized, highly synchronized. So is, this is called interbrain synchronization. And yellow is an action potentials being produced by neurons in the observer, observer's brain, and in the driver's brain. And as you can see, there are episodes of interbrain synchronization of up to 60%, which was very, very shocking to us. So when we zoom into this and we look at what this uh, synchronized activity could be encoding for, we found many things. We found velocity of the wheelchair, position of the chair in space, so, meaning both brains could represent that information simultaneously. But the most interesting thing was this. The interbrain synchronization reached a, a maximum when the alpha monkey was driving and getting about a meter and a half from the observer. So the synchronization was peaked when there was a proximity between the alpha monkey driving towards the observer, but not the opposite. If you put the observer driving the chair, the lower ranking monkey driving towards the alpha monkey, you saw some synchronization, but not even close to what we saw when the higher ranking monkey was driving towards the lower ranking monkey. So basically from M1 neurons, we could predict the ranking of our colony. We could classify the ranking, the social ranking of our animals and actually uh, extract other social parameters like reward, expectation of reward from the animals, which was never before expected to be coded by the, again, the poor primary motor cortex. This was really, really eye-opening for me because it showed that the primary the cortex in general is multitasking at a level that I never imagined before I could have these monkeys behaving freely. We know impediments for their uh, expression of their, you know, etologically meaningful behaviors. Well, all of these converge into the idea that John Chapin and I had proposed in 2003. Uh, we said it then, and we published this image showing, you know, if our results hold uh, like they had so far, it's conceivable to think that in less than a decade, we could have humans that are paralyzed due to a spinal cord injury using a brain machine interface to take advantage of the healthy brain that they still have uh, that is continuing to produce uh, motor uh, parameters or motor uh, uh, coding to basically allow these patients to uh, take advantage of a brain machine interface to wear a new body, what we at that time call a robotic suit that would allow them to, through a brain machine interface, not only move again, but receive feedback from this body, from this robotic suit, all the way to their brain so that they could, through the phenomenon of cortical plasticity, incorporate this new body as an extension of their own sense of self. Meaning that we could expand the sense of self that was uh, reduced dramatically by the spinal cord injury. You probably know that when a patient has a lesion like this, their sense of self uh, shrinks uh, to the level of the injury. So whatever is below is basically forgotten by the brain as being part of the person's sense of self. Well, John and I proposed that we could literally augment this. We could restore part of this sense of self by closing the loop between the subject's brain and a new body that in that case would be a robotic device. Uh, in 2012, when Brazil was awarded, uh, when we knew for sure that Brazil would host the 2014 World Cup, I had this idea then to test this notion. We we're getting close to our decade deadline. I told John that we had to do something to fulfill our promise. So I put together this international nonprofit consortium called the Walk Again Project and went to the Brazilian president at the time, a lady, President Dilma Rousseff, 
and the Secretary General of FIFA and said, well, what about if we had the opening ceremony at the World Cup, not the phony shows that we had for all this time, but we had a scientific demo where a Brazilian athlete that has been paraplegic for a while would deliver the opening kick of the World Cup by using the first brain control exoskeleton that would allow this person to actually not only kick the ball, but feel the impact of the ball and show this to an estimated audience of 1.2 billion people who watch those opening ceremonies live around the world. And to my complete shock, the president of Brazil said, well, where do I sign? It was the fastest grant review I ever had in my life. Uh, uh, you know, a meeting in the presidential palace in Brasilia, it took about 30 minutes. The problem is I got out of the presidential palace in this huge square that we have in Brasilia, separating the Supreme Court, the presidential palace and Congress. I took off the only tie I have and I started wondering, Jesus Christ, now I have to do it. How do I do it? Because I had nothing at that point, just the idea. So I started calling my friends and about 150 of them answered the phone call and volunteered to work for free as PIs and bring their students uh, to Brazil for uh, the craziest 18 months of my career to be able to pull this off. And we actually pulled this off. We first selected a pool of eight uh, paraplegic patients that had uh, suffered a very severe spinal cord injury, no uh, fewer than three years before the selection process was open. Most of our patients were chronic spinal cord injuries, of course. In fact, all of them were chronic spinal cord injury patients, some with more than a decade of injury. And we basically put them through the same kind of experiments using a non-invasive protocol for a brain machine interface, we use electroencephalography that doesn't require any implant, is a scalp electrodes that we can collect electrical activity from the brain. But we basically use the combination of virtual reality and robotics that you saw in some of the experiments that I revised with you a few minutes ago and put them through a very intense uh, training for six months from November 2013 to June 2014, when they went from virtual reality training to control avatars of themselves all the way to controlling a custom design, 12 degree of freedom, electrical, hydraulic, robotic exoskeleton controlled by brain activity. Uh, this is our first prototype, the one that was used during the opening ceremony of the World Cup. We, we are up to the third prototype. We probably will go announce in a few weeks, the fourth generation that is completely different and is controlled by iPhone. This is the electronics that we had to use in 2014. Seven years later, all of this is reduced to an iPhone that our patients can put on their shoulder and they can control a, a $10,000 exoskeleton. This was much more expensive, of course, it was the first prototype. But things have evolved tremendously since then. This is one of the key inventions of that exo uh, done by Gordon Sheng at the Technical University of Munich. This is what we call artificial skin. This is our printed circuit boards that contain pressure sensors. Uh, they are applied to the surface of the feet of the exo. So when the patient touches the ground, uh, the patient can feel the ground. And a wave of pressure is generated and delivered to the forearm through a haptic display. This is a fancy name of a bunch of cell phone vibrating elements that are putting Velcro and apply to the surface of the screen or the skin. So the patients feel the contact and we found the parameters because we put our patients to train with this system for months and we were able to, found, to find the parameters that allow them to have a phantom sensation each parameter developed its own, his own phantom sensation, meaning that they could feel the exo like if they were, uh, like the exo was an extension of their own body. And they would tell us, well, my leg is moving and touching the ground. 
And I would say, no, 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 it's not your leg. It's the exo's leg and your leg is inside the exo. No, it's my body. I can feel my body moving again. We documented this phantom sensation with a variety of tests. It was very impressive to see the psychophysics of this. Uh, and here it is, a one patient out of eight. I saw this scene eight times and it was the most touching moment of my career. I can tell you, I have 40 years of neuroscience and I never experienced anything like that when the patient for the first time after nine, 10, 13 years of a spinal cord injury came out of a wheelchair, he stood up and walk again using this brain control exoskeleton and felt in his own forearms, the contact with the ground. You're going to see this is a EEG base. This is a helmet for protection. This is a safety system to avoid any chance of falling. The patient is looking straight ahead to a huge mirror to provide visual feedback to the patient as he walk. And is of course, to synchronize with the tactile feedback he's getting on its uh, forearms. For those of you who understand Portuguese, uh, I'm not going to translate the curse word that the patient is, is using to celebrate at the end, but you'll see what I mean, how happy they are, uh, particularly this guy who was a swimmer before he had a spinal cord injury, an Olympic level swimmer. So he's walking for the first time in six years, touching the ground, seeing himself and feeling his legs moving in space and touching the ground. He's getting visual feedback from our system to say, look, you're doing perfectly fine. Your EG signals are doing this job correctly. And he's alternating left and right EG to control the left and right legs out in an alternative, alternating way, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so all eight patients became proficient and were able, they qualified to deliver the opening kickoff, but of course we had only one guy that could do it. And he did it on June 12, 3.30 in the afternoon here in Sao Paulo, unfortunately in the wrong team's stadium, not the correct team, but he did. And when I went to Beijing a couple of years later to give a talk to the entire country uh, via the Chinese public TV, the director of the TV said that he was directing the transmission from the World Cup. He introduced me telling this story and he gave me a plate celebrating because I didn't realize the day I was giving that talk in Beijing was the anniversary, the second anniversary of the kick. And he gave me a plate showing that at the moment of the kick, 1.2 billion people watched the kick around the world. So it was a scientific demonstration that gave you know, a lot of people a lot of hope. And most people thought that that was the end, but that was not the end. A month after the World Cup was over, we came back to the lab to do the neurological testing of these experiments, which was mandatory in our clinical protocol in Brazil. And of course, we didn't expect anything because throughout the years and throughout the six months we interact with the patients, their clinical status had not changed. They were all consider Asia a chronic spinal cord injury patients. However, that afternoon in July of 2014, our chief neurologist came to me and said, there's something wrong. I said, what happened? He said, well, Lu Giuliano, who delivered the kick of the opening kick of the World Cup was a T4 for 10 years, meaning he couldn't feel and couldn't move anything below the thoracic level four. I just did his examination. This morning, he's a T11 now. He has recovered sensitivity and movement partially uh, seven dermatomes below the level of his original injury. Well, this afternoon I got a second patient. She was a T11, no longer. She recovers six dermatomes uh, on her sensitivity and motor test. On average that week, our patients had recovered five dermatomes below the level of the injury. That had never happened in the literature. So when we look and follow these guys quietly for 24 months, completing 28 months of follow-up, 
on average, they recover 10 dermatomes below the level of the injury in terms of tactile sensitivity and later motor control. What it means to have recovered so much partial voluntary motor control? Well, this is one of our patients. A year after, we put her 22 months after training, we put her suspended in a typical test that we did with all patients and asked her to move, try to move any way she could. Prior to this testing, these patients could do nothing. Of course, they would not move. They were completely paralyzed. Well, look what happened. This lady was paralyzed for 13 years. Oops. She was paralyzed for 13 years. This is 22 months of training. And suddenly she does that on us. She starts walking on air. First the right leg, then the left leg. We move her back and she kept doing that. And the cables you see are EMG recording cables. So you could document the muscle activity showing that she was basically voluntarily contracting muscles below the waist. She was flexing her hip, flexing her knee and extending her ankle for the first time in 13 years. And so were several of our patients in different degrees. What that meant was that this training after 28 years, uh, 28 months, I'm sorry, one of our patients had to drop the protocol after 12 months, but the seven patients that we followed up in different moments in time, they all got upgraded. And this is for the first time in the history of spinal cord injury that people reported this in several patients. These were chronic patients. They were classified as a Asia A by the American classification of spinal cord injury. This is the most severe, no movement, no sensitivity below the level. Seven were Asia A, one was Asia B. Also no movement below the level. After 28 months of training, all seven patients that remain in the protocol were upgraded to Asia C, meaning that they became partial paraplegics because now they could have some sort of partial tactile vibration, proprioception sensation below the level of the injury. They regained visceral control, for instance, of the bladder some of these patients have complete full control of the bladder after the training, something that they didn't have before. And they start producing voluntary motor control. The recovery was so dramatic in a few of these patients that we proposed to put them into a new protocol using a, another technology called functional electrical stimulation, a non-invasive way to deliver small electrical charges to key muscles, particularly the muscles that they had recovered some voluntary control. This is one patient that is using a brain machine interface to use his EEG to control the delivery of these electrical charges to 12 different muscles, six in each leg. His recovery was so tremendous that just with the addition of this new technology, he was able to move by himself, just using this little cart, a $10 cart for body support and the support system that I mentioned to you before. But now he was able to create a gait pattern using a combination of his voluntary motor control and this functional electrical stimulation of his uh, about 12 muscles of his legs. So basically what I tried to show to you that is from the original basic science idea to explore how populations of neurons encode information, we got all the way to a new neuroprosthetic device that is non-invasive and now has been reproduced independently uh, by another group that is showing even more surprising recovery because they were able to do a more intense protocol than we did. We did twice a week, one hour a day. 
They were able to do five days a week, one hour a day, and now has moved not only to spinal cord, but also to stroke rehab. So this is just the beginning. Uh, I don't have time to, to show you what we are doing in Parkinson's disease with a different neuroprosthetic device, but it's the same general concept of a brain machine brain interface that is now being used for Parkinsonian patients, chronic epileptic patients, stroke victims, and I hope in the next few years, we will see this applied to a, a very large variety of neurological and even psychiatric disorders that as the World Health Organization reported uh, two years ago, one out of seven human beings have some sort of brain disorder. We talk about close to a billion people. And for the first time in my career, I'm optimistic that we may come up with new therapies to help a great number of these people worldwide to recover some of the functions they lost to disease or to trauma. Thank you very much.